Hello, everybody, and welcome. Welcome to this lecture series for Hope for HIE. My name is Edward Hervitz, Ed Hervitz. I'm the professor and chair in the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation at the University of Michigan. I'm also a pediatric rehabilitation specialist, but about a dozen years ago, I noted as my patients were growing up, it was they were having unique problems that not many people really understood. So I became interested in the medical and social problems of adults with cerebral palsy. We started a research group and today's lecture will tell you what some of the research tells us about care of the adult with cerebral palsy. First off, disclosures, I have nothing to disclose. And here's our research group. We're the Michigan Adults with Pediatric Onset Disability Group. And this is our team. There's myself, I'm a pediatric rehabilitation specialist, a physiatrist. Then there's Dr. Mark Peterson, Dr. Dan Whitney, who are our research specialists, Dr. Heidi Hoppala, and then going down to the lower row, Dr. Mary Schmidt, who are also physiatrists, but they're adult physiatrists, so they specialize in adults with cerebral palsy. Dana Ryan is our physical therapist, Mary Ayat is our occupational therapist, and Dr. Bridget Waldron Perrine is our neuropsychologist. We meet, have clinical discussions, plan for research, and, and then do lectures and write papers about things as I'm doing today. So the Adult with Cerebral Palsy Clinic at the University of Michigan was founded in 2008. Dr. Dr. Heidi Hoppala is pictured here, and Dr. Mary Schmidt, as I told you before, joined me in seeing adults in that clinic. It has an adult focus. We deal with adult medical issues. We talk about employment, higher education, and relationships. The clinic goals are to do a function and pain assessment, screen for common associated conditions, and that's what we're going to talk about today. We give education about aging with cerebral palsy to our patients and we talk about community resources and social supports. Let's start off with this. This is the International Classification of Function, which we use when we think about disabilities. Let's we'll start at the top with a pediatric onset disability like cerebral palsy. The box all the way over on the left is the a body composition box. So we think about the muscles, the bone, bones, the limbs, the joints as they develop in the developing child and they develop abnormally. This leads to problems in our activity box, which is walking, movement, activities of daily living, ADL, are all affected. And then over on the right is the decreased participation and decreased activities in the community. That's our participation box. So when we think about a disability such as cerebral palsy, we think about it across the spectrum. How is the body affected? How is the ability to do things affected? And how is the ability to participate in the community affected? There are several factors that influence all of these things, environmental factors like a lack of information about adults with cerebral palsy and a lack of access to health care and, and to participation. And there's personal factors like there's no life pattern of activity for people with cerebral palsy. They, they don't get involved in, in sports and so forth when they're, they're kids and end up being more sedentary as we'll talk about. And often individuals with cerebral palsy and other pediatric onset disabilities have poor social skills, which interferes with a lot of things in their life. So let's take a case example. <clears throat> let's meet David. Uh, David, of course, who's hypothetical, is a 31-year-old man. He's GMFS, GMFCS2. That means he's Gross Motor Functional Classification Scale 2. It's a scale that goes one through five with individuals who are one being able to move the best and walk the best. Individuals that are five use a wheelchair all the time. David's a two. He has some trouble walking and he has spastic bilateral cerebral palsy, SBCP, meaning his cerebral palsy is spastic and affects both sides of his body. He was born 31 years ago prematurely and had an interventricular hemorrhage. He had bleeding in his brain, HIE. And then he had a rhizotomy, a selective dorsal rhizotomy, a surgical procedure to reduce his spasticity 25 years ago. And he has ongoing lower extremity Botox injections. I, I inject uh, his, his legs with uh, botulinum toxin to help reduce the spasticity. His social history, he's single, but he's in a relationship. He works in a community center and he takes college courses. He exercises once to twice a week. So he comes into clinic and he has several concerns. He has chronic back and leg pain. He's not able to do as much as he used to do. He just doesn't seem to have the energy to do it. He's struggling with school and work. It's just exhausting. I ask him what his other doctors have told him, and he tells me he has no other doctors. No other doctors are interested in seeing an adult with cerebral palsy. And he's concerned about this thing he's heard about on the web, early aging. What is that? So I do a health screening on him. We look at his cardiovascular risk, and we look at his body composition. 
his BMI, his body mass index, which is an indication for us about his weight, his height, and tells us something about body fat, is 24.9. That's normal. But his waist circumference, his waist uh, hip circumference ratio is 0 0.96. That's relatively high for a young man with a normal BMI. His blood pressure is 132 over 78. Not bad, but a little elevated with that 132. He does physical activity and exercise once to twice a week, but he doesn't find it satisfactory. He doesn't seem to be able to get into a real exercise pattern that he finds works for him. I look at his blood work. I look at his, his uh, fats in his blood, his, his lipids, his cholesterol, and his high density lipoproteins, which are supposed to be high, are actually a little low. And his total cholesterol, which should be lower, is actually a little high at 205, giving him cardiac risk factors. His bone health, well, his vitamin D is low at 19. As far as his bowels, uh, without going into what the PAC sim is, he's showing some signs of constipation. And I ask him about his mental state. I ask him some screening questions. And he says he has a decreased interest in doing things. And he's just feeling down. So I'm interested in the issue that his uh, body mass index was normal. His vitamin D was 19. His waist circumference, hip circumference ratio was high. So I do what's called a DEXA scan to look at some of these things. And I find that his, as I mentioned, his body mass index is right here in the green normal range. But look at his body fat. It's at the 90th percentile. It's that little dot there at the top of the curve. So he has a very high body fat percent, even though he has a normal BMI. And I find that his bone density is very low, even though he's an active young man. So what we see is, is that because of his cerebral palsy, he has less muscle mass and he has less bone mass. So even though he has a normal BMI, that's because he has way too much fat, giving him cardiac risk. So here's a, a question. Given the documented loss or absence of this lean body mass, muscle and bone, and the increased storage of visceral and muscular adipose tissue, that's fat, is there an increased risk for chronic disease and cerebral palsy for adults with cerebral palsy? Well, this is from something we published in JAMA uh, a few years ago. The yellow bars are people without cerebral palsy and the blue bars are people with cerebral palsy. And you see that in every one of these diseases, diabetes, asthma, hypertension, heart problems, stroke, and so forth, people with cerebral palsy have an increased amount of people having the disease and increased prevalence and have increased risk for the diseases. So we see that this body composition issue plays a role in giving people an increased risk for chronic diseases across the board. <clears throat> there are other factors that influence this we found in this study, being a little bit older. Obesity makes you at higher risk. Degree, degree of physical disability, the more disabled the person was, the higher their risk. And then physical inactivity, being physically inactive, being more sedentary, increased the risk. Are people with cerebral palsy more physically inactive? Are they more sedentary? This is a combined findings from several studies. And these bars here are sedentary behavior. I mentioned the gross motor functional classification scale. This is one, the people that are able to walk best. This is five, people that use a wheelchair all the time and then the grades in between. And you see that even the highest grade, the people that can walk the best, spend more than 75% of their time sitting in sedentary behavior. When they're not sitting, they're engaged in low-level LPA, low-level physical activity, and very, very little percent of their time is spent in moderate to uh, very uh, high-level physical activity. So yes, people with cerebral palsy tend to be more sedentary than people without cerebral palsy. Let's talk about bone health. In individuals with cerebral palsy, there's a high incidence of osteopenia and osteoporosis, weak bones, as I mentioned in our, our case example even in people that walk around. We see that 35 to 40% have decreased bone mineral density. And the older they get, the more osteoporosis they have. Here's people who we found in 18 to 25 who did not have any problems noted with their bones. But look at these two lines, the red and the green. Osteopenia, which means weak bones, and osteoporosis, which means very weak bones, both are showing up at 18 to 25. And as they get older, some of those osteopenia patients turn into osteoporosis. This gives them a higher risk of fractures. And we found that fractures are associated with higher morbidity, morbidity and mortality. This is from a study that we published about that. We found that low trauma fractures, in other words, not from car accidents, but even just from like falls or, or, or things like that, actually increase mortality risk. We found that 
three months after the fact, fracture, six months, all the way up to three years after the fracture, individuals, adults with cerebral palsy who had had a fracture were at higher risk of mortality of dying than people with cerebral palsy who did not have a fracture. So it tells us that bone density is a very important issue, something that we need to address. Uh, if someone has a fracture, we, make to sh we have to make sure that they get rehabilitated, that they're up and moving around to prevent these complications. In fact, people with cerebral palsy tend to have a lot of MSK, musculoskeletal. That means problems with the muscles and the joints and the bones. Uh, multimorbidity, which means that they have more than one problem with these areas. And we found that that starts at 31 to 40 years. So anybody out there that's in their 30s may not expect to have problems with their, their bones and their joints, but we found that people with cerebral palsy will tend to have more than one diagnosis of bone and joint problems. And then, get, then like the rest of us, it gets more as we go through the years. Another issue we've been researching lately has to do with chronic kidney disease. There's a significant increased risk of chronic kidney disease for adults with cerebral palsy. We mentioned <coughs> about adults with cerebral palsy having certain cardiac risks, and this may be related to hypertension or cause hypertension. The extra body fat can lead to hypertension, and we think their kidney disease may be related to hypertension as well. However, there is some uh, reports out that premature birth may also contribute to poor kidney function, and that may play a risk as well because so many people with cerebral palsy are born prematurely. The way we measure kidney function involves something called a creatinine test, but the creatinine test is dependent on muscle mass. So people with cerebral palsy who have muscle atrophy, uh, for them, monitoring with the creatinine may not work well. And this is a problem because they'll go to see their doctors, they'll get their blood drawn, and they'll be told that they look fine, that there's nothing wrong with their kidneys, but actually uh, the numbers don't work for these folks, just like the BMI numbers don't work. So there's a lot of interesting issues about how we look for risk in people with cerebral palsy because their bodies are different. Pain and fatigue are the most common reasons that people come to see us in the adults with cerebral palsy clinic. This is some numbers, 54 to 70% of adults report significant pain monthly to weekly. Those numbers vary in different studies, but they're all that high. The back, the legs, the hips are the most common places. The impact on quality of life for the person and the caregiver is quite significant. It interferes with work and life and 60% of more patients who have pain tell us that this. The pain may be underreported and it may be undertreated. Why? Well, for one thing, many patients with cerebral palsy have decreased cognition and communication skills. They're not able to tell us they have pain. Also, people with cerebral palsy often grow up with pain. A lot of kids with cerebral palsy have pain. And they may not even think it's something to talk to their doctor about. It's just something they live with, something they've had for years, something that's just part of who they are. And so they never really get the, the, the treatment. Sometimes the signs for pain are not well read. Uh, I've dealt with kids that were not able to talk, that when you move their hips and they were painful, they actually laughed. Well, people thought that they thought something was funny or it was tickling them, but we've learned that that may be a reaction that's painful. And then there's poor access to treatment. There's a lot of treatments for pain, especially for chronic pain that involve having transportation, having good insurance, uh, just having the time and the ability to, to go and do the treatments. Um, communication becomes sometimes important in treatment for pain. And not everybody with cerebral palsy has access to all of these things. Fatigue is another big issue. It's reported in 30 to 60% of individuals with cerebral palsy. We do a lot of spasticity management for people with cerebral palsy. We have reports that the spastic tone increases and decreases in adults. We're not really sure what happened. There's a lot of factors that go into that, but uh, we do know that it changes in adults, but for some it seems to go up, some seems to go down. It depends what other factors are going on in their life. We treat it several ways, and this is a very long lecture to talk about spasticity treatment, but I just wanted to mention a few things. One, there's pills for uh, pills for spasticity, oral medications, but it's important to consider the side effects. It includes sedation, which is particularly important uh, when we think about things like driving and working and this kind of thing. I've had adults with cerebral palsy that told me that they stopped taking the medication because they weren't able to do their work. It also decreases libido, and we're talking about adults who may be in relationships and uh, you know may want to not want to trade spasticity management for that. <clears throat> 
we use botulinum toxin of uh, various kinds frequently. When we uh, do uh, adults with cerebral palsy, it's approved for spasticity management in adults. Uh, and then as far as surgical treatment, we use intrathecal baclofen pumps, uh, which I'll invite you to look up, baclofen pump. Uh, I won't talk about it too much in this lecture. The selective dorsal rhizotomy that I mentioned for David when he was a child, it's very rare that we do it in adults, although some centers are starting to do it more. Um, but uh, more frequently, when we think about wanting to do a more advanced surgical treatment in adults with cerebral palsy, we think about the back lift and pump. Mental health issues is an increasingly recognized and important issue in adults with cerebral palsy. Depression and anxiety are very common. Some people think it's related, related to their decreased participation. It may be related to sleep problems, to pain, it may be related to neurologic factors. It may be related to the brain damage that occurred or the brain malformation that's there from the time when they were from very close to the time of birth. All these years later, their brain may not be producing the right chemicals to help them get through issues related to depression and anxiety. There's also a report of increased incidence of more important psychotic illnesses. I, what I mean, more severe psychotic illnesses like manic depressive disease and schizophrenia. So uh, all these things are present in adults with cerebral palsy and need to be carefully managed. Unfortunately, there is a real capacity issue, a real lack of services for mental health issues in adults with cerebral palsy. This is a study where we looked at prevalence of mental health disorders among adults with cerebral palsy. And we see that in men and in women, uh, individuals who had cerebral palsy had these, uh, had these problems more often than people without cerebral palsy. And when it was combined with another neurodevelopmental disorder like autism, so cerebral palsy and autism together, the incidence was even higher. So this is a significant problem that really needs to be addressed. Poor sleep is common in neurologic syndromes and it's increasingly recognized as a problem in cerebral palsy. Sleep is a function of the brain and cerebral palsy is a problem with the brain. Having problems with sleep can affect many aspects of health. It's associated with poor health in, in the cardiac and cardiometabolic areas. Of course, it affects function and affects many, many things. So it's something we often address in clinic. I talked about constipation, it's common. Uh, we did a study here where we found that uh, 63 adults that we looked at, 52% had symptoms of constipation, something we frequently talk about in clinic. When we think about constipation, we don't think about it as a terribly important issue, but unfortunately, when we look at our patients from clinic that get admitted to the hospital, many of them get admitted because of uncontrolled constipation. And think about it, what might be the effect of constipation on pain, on fatigue, on function? What about proper nutrition? So constipation becomes an increasingly important issue. Well, let's get a little less medical for a minute. Let's talk about relationships. So people with cerebral palsy, adults with cerebral palsy are generally less socially active than their uh, typically developing peers. The onset of dating is delayed and the frequency of dating is lower. The level of sexual knowledge is lower. As you might imagine, there's probably less conversations about it with your disabled child, uh, but studies tell us there is no less interest. So certainly physical function, like the gross motor functional classification scale, which we've been talking about, plays a role in whether uh, someone will have uh, a sexual partner and be sexually active. But there's other factors that may be even more important, like self-efficacy, self-esteem, sexual esteem, perceived attractiveness. So uh, all of these things may play a role that is greater in finding a, a sexual relationship than even the physical functioning. <clears throat> We know that in adults with cerebral palsy, that, that uh, marriage or some sort of permanent relationship, uh, independent living, employment, all of these psychosocial outcomes are lower. Let's talk about driving, which is one of the great moments of independence in any young person's life. So individuals with cerebral palsy have challenges when it comes to driving. There's the issue of motor coordination that you need to work the vehicle. There's processing. People with cerebral palsy have a longer reaction time. It takes them longer to react to a situation in front of them. That was certainly important when you need to hit the brakes. And then a lot of people with cerebral palsy have visual issues. So in terms of just some of the coordination issues, when the legs are not well coordinated, but the hands are, hand controls can be a very important fix for that. Autonomous cars really give a new window of hope for adults with cerebral palsy. There is uh, 
many issues that we have to deal with before we say that everybody with cerebral palsy and anybody with a disability is going to be able to drive. First of all, they have to be able to get independently into the vehicle in order for them to drive independently. Secondly, they have to have some access to the controls. They have to be able to at least speak to the car or talk about things sometimes like brain computer interface where someone can just think at a car or think of something and make it work. There is some studies going on with uh, that kind of setup and that may help some of the individuals who are unable to speak and unable to use their hands. But to do that, the car needs to be fully autonomous. It needs to be able to do everything by itself and not expect a driver to take over. So that's a barrier and we're several years off from solving that barrier, according to conversations I've had with people from the University of Michigan Transportation Research Institute. But it's out there and it's growing. And I think it's going to be a solution for people with cerebral palsy and other disabilities sometime in our lifetime. People with cerebral palsy have increased healthcare needs and adults with cerebral palsy and young adults with cerebral palsy have more healthcare needs than their peers. There's care visits for teens and young adults are twice the time of their peers and hospitalization is four to 10 times what their peers could go to the hospital. Finding providers is difficult for them. As I mentioned, there are many areas where we have difficulty finding providers that are interested in seeing adults with cerebral palsy. So because of that, a individual with cerebral palsy is less likely to see a specialist after high school. The address I have there uh, on the slide is to a, a website that talks about uh, a list of adults providers for people with cerebral palsy. Accessibility is an issue. Not every physician's clinic, believe it or not, is set up for people with disabilities. Uh, talking about getting onto high tables or getting in through small doors if you have a wheelchair or a small clinic room can be very difficult. Seeing an adult with cerebral palsy takes more time than a simple appointment. Sometimes it's hard for them to express themselves. Sometimes they just have many problems to deal with. They can be quite complex. Sometimes it takes more than just a pill or a shot to solve their problems. Women have special issues. Getting women's care, uh, preventative care, like uh, mammograms and pap smears, can be a real challenge for people that are wheelchair users and have disabilities. <clears throat> There's a well-described pattern of functional decline in adults with cerebral palsy. There's uh, many, many studies that uh, talk about this. I always quote the one from Oppheim in 2009, which was a seven-year follow-up on 1999 study. And there was a report of decreased walking function, loss of walking function in 1999, and 10 years later, it had increased from 39% to 52%, including 37% of patients who were just affected on one side of the body people that we talk about having mild cerebral palsy, they lost walking function, uh, many of them lost walking function uh, as time went on. For people that have cerebral palsy on both sides of the body, when they got to about 37 years old, right around that time, the end of the fourth decade, they started to really have difficulty with walking function. For the people that are affected on one side, it took more until their 50s. But I know certainly those of you out there listening who are in their 50s or approaching their 50s, you have no expectation of losing walking function. I'm past my 50s and I certainly don't. So hearing that people with relatively mild cerebral palsy when they get into their 50s may have difficulty with walking and need more support like wheelchairs or scooters uh, can be very disheartening for people. But this is what we're seeing. The loss of walking functions associated with reports of pain and fatigue. So the combination of things that we've talked about, including loss of, of walking function, pain, some of the medical problems we're talking about coming on early in life, all of these things coming on earlier in life, sometimes in their 30s, sometimes even in their 20s. So this is the phenomenon that is called commonly called early aging. And why does it occur? Well, that loss of function we just talked about being related to pain and fatigue. But why does that occur? So we've talked about some of these things, decreased levels of fitness, the burden of multimorbidity of chronic diseases. We talked about musculoskeletal diseases and fracture risk, heart diseases, cardiometabolic, lung diseases, respiratory, kidney, renal, mental health issues, poor sleep, poor access to healthcare to help these problems, poor access to participation to get a person active out of their chair, moving around, and then neuromotor control. Do people lose function with time because of some loss in their nervous system? Cerebral palsy starts off as damage or malformation in the nervous system. Well, everyone's nervous system falls off somewhat with time as they get older. 
how does that affect cerebral palsy in terms of their ability to move themselves through motor control? So here's some of the take home points. Well, the neuropathology of cerebral palsy is not correctable. The factors that we have discussed today can potentially be helped with proper intervention, proper access to healthcare and proper follow through on the, uh, the things that we talked about. So we must integrate a healthy lifestyle approach in our practice and educate others. This is what I tell my, my physician colleagues. We must start talking to people about a healthy lifestyle, where to start. So this is what I say when I talk to the other physicians. Exercise is healthy and safe. Well, people used to not think that. They used to think that exercise might be bad for cerebral palsy because it might make them more spastic or it might hurt them or this kind of thing. But we find that a lack of exercise is worse for people with cerebral palsy than for others, putting them at higher risk of chronic diseases for all the reasons I just explained. They have poor levels of fitness compared to other people. So they have more fatigue, functional loss, and pain. So exercise is good. We have found that it will not make a person more spastic. And also, you don't have to go to physical therapy to be physically better. A lot of people think that they need more physical therapy. They've been getting it all their life as a child, and now they're feeling fatigued and, and tired and they think they need to go to physical therapy. They need to exercise. And the message we tell them is, you will not hurt yourself if you do it right. The question is, how do you do it right? Well, we've been doing some work with that and uh, we have a toolbox for, for helping with that. Um, this is a uh, information sheet for the American Academy of Stereo Palsy and Developmental Medicine that we've disseminated about physical fitness and exercise for adults with stereo palsy. This is an important website. It comes out of the University of Alabama run by a Dr. Jim Rimmer. It's uh, the National Center for Health and Physical Activity and Disability. It has all kinds of tips about health and exercise, especially exercise and physical activity. An important website for people to uh, get information. And there's many other sources on the web as well. The information base is growing. This is a paper that we wrote not long ago about exercise and physical activity recommendations for people with cerebral palsy. So I tell all the physicians and caregivers to put physical activity on the checklist, review healthy behaviors with their patients. How much physical activity do they get? What kind of physical activity? What are the barriers to physical activity? What's the patient's concerns about being more physically active? Are they concerned that they're going to hurt themselves? And what's their knowledge about it? An important thing to discuss with all of our patients. And then monitor for risk for all the diseases that we talked about. Don't look at that body mass index because I showed you why it wouldn't work. Look at the waist hip ratio. That seems to work much better. And then the other chronic disease risks, looking at uh, blood levels of lipids, cholesterol, and so forth. Looking at kidney issues, asking about depression, measuring for bone density issues. Telemedicine has opened up a big window for us to help adults with cerebral palsy. Even though I can't address everything through telemedicine, there's many things I can address. We can do medications follow up. We can talk about constipation and I can advise them through what over-the-counter medications they can take for it. We can talk about their mood and their fatigue. We can talk about what kind of equipment they need and do all the health promotion things that we need to talk about in terms of exercise, eating healthy and these kind of things. All those things can be done with a telemedicine outreach and we're exploring ways that we can reach more people with telemedicine. This is Duncan Wyeth. Duncan's from Michigan and he's very famous as an advocate as a, a cerebral palsy uh, high level athlete in his youth. Um, and he was a, a adjunct professor at Michigan State University. He came and spoke in our department and he said, you have to spread the word. You have to reach out to primary care doctors, physicians, physicians assistants, nurse practitioners. And he reminds us that information is power, that we have to teach them how to teach their patients how they can stay functional and well. So here we are, that's what I'm That's what I'm doing. I'm reaching out, we're trying to build capacity of, of physicians, we're trying to educate more families uh, and just trying to let people know about what goes on when we become an adult with cerebral palsy because information is power. So in the adult with cerebral palsy clinic, we make sure that we, we have, to, we try always make sure we have the time to talk to patients. We're rehab doctors, so we address spasticity, wheelchairs and braces like any rehab doctor, but we emphasize the quality of life issues, all the things that I've talked about there. So that's how research has influenced our care with adult cerebral palsy. I really wanna thank everybody for their time and listening to the lecture today. If you have questions, I, I won't do medical consultation by email, but I'm happy to talk about possibly arranging to uh, have you seen by somebody in our group if need be, but I can answer general questions. That's my email.
And thank you again. Thank you.